The Cube presents HPE Discover 2022. Brought to you by HPE. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Cube's day one coverage of HPE Discover 22 live from the Venetian in Las Vegas. I got a power panel here. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante, John Furrier, Holger Muller also joins us. We are going to wrap this like you've never seen a wrap before. Guys, a <laughs> lot of momentum today, a lot, lot of excitement, about 8,000 or so customers, partners, HPE leaders here. Holger, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. What are some of the things that you heard, felt, saw, observed today on day one? Yeah, it's great to be back in person, right? 8,000 people events are rare. Uh, I'm not sure, have you been to more than 8,000? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, okay, this year, this year. I mean, historically, yes, but... Um, Snowflake so, was 10. Yeah. So, oh, wow, okay, yeah. so 8,000 is my... Cisco was, they said 15, but... Is my, my, 8,000 is my record. SAP yeah. let us down of 7,000, kind of like, but it's in the Florida swamps, not nicely like... And there's usually <laughs> what Vegas. at Sapphire? There's usually yeah. 20? 20, 30, 40, yeah. 50. Right. I remember wow. 50 in the 90s, right? That was a different time, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah, interesting what people do. It depends how much time there is to come, right? And know that it happens, right? But yeah, no, I think it's interesting. We, we had a good analyst track today. Um, interesting, like HPE is kind of like back not being your grandfather's HPE to a certain point. One of the key stats, I know Dave, you're always for the stats, right? Is what I found really interesting that over two-thirds of GreenLake revenue is software and services. Now, I'd love to know how much of that is services and how much of that is software. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, I provocated some in one to ones the HPE executives saying, hey, you're a hardware company, right? And they didn't even come back, right? But Antonio said, no, two thirds is uh, hard, it's software and services, right? That's interesting. They passed the one exabyte uh, being managed uh, as, a, as a hallmark, right? I was surprised, only 120,000 users, if I had to remember the number right, right? So that doesn't seem a terrible high amount of number of users, right? So. But that's, that's, that's promising. So what software is in there? Because it's got to be mostly services, right? Well, it's the 70 plus cloud services, right? That everybody's right. talking about, where they added eight of them, shockingly, backup and recovery. I thought that was done <laughs> at launch, right? Storage who would, still hunt. Who would expect say, from... Keep recycling storage and back, <laughs> and back but, but, but now but, it's real. Yeah, but the company <laughs> who knows the enterprise, right? HPE, <laughs> so what have we been doing before with no backup and recovery <laughs> with GreenLake? So then it was kind of like, okay, you really want to do this now and newly? And then say like, oh, by the way, we've been doing this all the time. Yeah. Okay, what's your take on the install base of HP? We had that conversation, the uh, kickoff around yeah. who's their target, what's the target audience environment look like? IT certainly is changing. Right. If it's software and services, GreenLake is resonating. Yeah. Uh, ecosystem's responding. What's their customers? Because managed services are up too. Kubernetes, right. all the managed services. Yep. What's, the, what's it like? What's their IT well. transformation base look like? Much of it is, of course, the install base, right? The trusted 20, 30 plus year old HP customer who's keeping doing stuff with HP, right? And call it GreenLake, whatever. Right? They've been through so many name changes, it doesn't really matter. And it's kind of like nice that you get the consume, paying only what you consume, right? I get the cloud brought to me. Then the general market is, of course, people who still need to run stuff on premises, right? And there's three reasons of doing this. Performance, right? Because we know the speed of light is relative. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere and even your email server is in the Northern Hemisphere, it takes a moment for your email to arrive. It's a very different user experience. Um, local legislation for data residency, privacy, and then, I mean, Charles Phillips, who we all know, right? Former president of uh, Info nicely always said, hey, if the CIO is over 50, I don't have to sell cloud, right? <laughs> so there is a not invented, I'm not going to do cloud here. And now I've kind of like clouded with something like HP yeah, GreenLake, yeah. so that's the customers. And then of course procurement is a big friend, right? Because yeah. when you do hardware refresh, Right? You don't have to have two or three competitors. Who are the two or three competitors left, right? There's Dell, yeah. and then maybe Lenovo, right? Yeah. So, so that, that's Cisco, kind of like the market. Bit. So you have the, ch bit, the yeah. channels are strength, right. the procurement yes. positions are strength, of course. install base. Question, do you think they have a Microsoft opportunity where what 365 was, Microsoft had Office before 365, right. Right. they brought in the cloud and yep. then everything changed. Yep. Does HP have that same opportunity with kind of the Green Lake, you know, model with all their existing stuff? It has the green lake opportunity, but there's not much software left. It's a very different situation like Microsoft, right? So, uh, which green, which HPE could bring along to say, now run it with us better on the cloud because they've been selling much of it, most of it, of their software portfolio, which they bought as an HP in the past, right? So I don't see that happening so much, but GreenLake as a platform itself, of course, interesting because enterprise need a modern container-based platform. I want, I want to yeah. double click on this a little bit because the way I see it is, HP is going to its install base, I think you guys are right on, say yep. this is how we're doing business now. Yep. You know, come on along. But my sense is some customers don't want to do the consumption model. There are actually some customers who say, hey, of course. I, got, I don't have a cash problem, I want to pay for it up front and leave me alone. 
<laughs> I've been doing this since 50 years. Right, Why yeah, should yeah, I change it now? Right, right, <laughs> right, exactly. No, no. Like, Here's the money. Wants to do it, and I don't want to rent because yeah. rental's more expensive and, right. and blah, blah, blah. So do you see that in the customer base that, oh, that some are pushing back? Of course. Look, I have a German accent, right? So I go there regularly, <laughs> and uh, the Germans are like worried about doing anything in the cloud. And if you go to a board in Germany and say, hey, we can pay our usual hardware refresh, CapEx as usual, or should we buy consumption? And they might know what we are running. <laughs> 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 so nothing, no offense against the Germans out there and the German boards out there, but many of them will yeah. say, hey, so this is change with COVID, right? Which is super interesting, right? So. The, the traditional boards, non-technical, have been hearing about this cloud, variable cost, OPEX to CAPEX. And all of a sudden, there's so much CAPEX, right? Office buildings which are not being used, yeah. truck fleets which are not used. So there's a whole new sensitivity by traditional non-technical boards towards yeah. CAPEX, which now the light bulb went on and say, oh, that's the cloud thing about also. So we have to find a way to get our cost structure to ramp up and ramp down as our business might be ramping up through yeah. COVID, through now inflation fears, recession fears, and so on. So Okay, HP's, HP's made the statement that you, anything you can do in the cloud, you can do in GreenLake. Yes. And I've said, you can't run on Snowflake, you can't run Mongo Atlas, you can't run Databricks, but that's okay, that's yeah. fine. Let's be, I think they're talking There's about- There's a short list of things I think don't they're talking about the, the, yeah. the, <laughs> stuff. the operating stuff. experience. Yeah. So we've got single sign-on through a URL. Right. Uh, you've got you know, some level of consistency in terms of policy. It's unclear exactly what right. that is. You got storage, backup, DR, what? some other services, 70 other services. If you had to sort of take your best guess as to where HP is now and peg it toward where Amazon was in which year? 2014. 2014, yeah. yeah. When they had their first conference or the second reinvent here with 3,000 people and yeah. they were thinking, hey, we're big, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, GreenLake is the building block. So the, right. you know, that's the Billing, question. right, I mean, similar. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, they had EC2 e e and S3 and, and, and SQS, right? That was right. the core. And then the rest of those services were, I mean, base dunk was the one that first came in behind. And it. in fairness, the industry has advanced since then. Kubernetes yeah. is further along, and so HPE right. can take advantage of that. But in terms of just the basic platform, I would agree, I think it's... Well, I mean, I think, I mean, the software question is a big one I want to bring up because the question is, is that software is eating the world, hardware is really software, scales everything, data, the edge story. I love their story. I think HP story is wonderful. Aruba. You know, hybrid cloud, story. edge to edge. But if you look under the covers, it's weak, right? It's like, it's not software. They don't have enough software juice. Yeah. Yeah. But the ecosystem opportunity to me is where you plug and play. So HP knows that game. Right. If you look historically over the past 25 years, HP, now HPE, they understand plug and play interoperability. So the question is, can they thread the needle right. between filling the gaps on the software yep. with partners? Can they get the partners, right? And which has been a long time, right? For a long time, HP has been the number one platform under ICP. Right, same thing, you get certified for running this, right? I know from my own history, uh, I joined Oracle last century and the big thing was, let's get your e-business suite certified on HP, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. As if somebody would HP buy that, right? But it could work for them, right? This is right. 20 years That's ago. Right? So, server, you know? The original yeah. Exadata was HP yeah. Oracle. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so there's this thinking that's there. But, but I think the, the key thing is we know that all modern, forget about the hardware for more in the platforms, yeah. right? All modern software has to move to containers. And yeah. Snowflake runs in containers. You mentioned that, right? Yeah. If customers force Snowflake and HPE to the table, right, there will be a way to make it work, right? And which will help HPE yeah. to be the partner open part of bringing the software in. I, I, think it's, I think that's an opportunity because that changes the game. And agility and speed, if HP plays their differentiation right, which we asked on our opening segment, what's their differentiation? They got size, scale, right. channel. What Access the, to the enterprise. And, and the big benefit is this workload portability thing, right? You understand what is run in the public cloud, I need to run it local for whatever reason, performance, local residency of data, I can move that there. And that's a big benefit to the ISVs and SaaS vendors as well. But they right? have to have a stronger data platform story in my that's opinion. Right. I mean, I, you can run Oracle and HPE, but yep. there's no reason they shouldn't be able to do a deal with, with Snowflake. I mean, yep. we saw it with Dell, yep. we saw it with, with, with Pure, mm -hmm. and I, if I were HPE, I'd be saying, hey, because the way the Snowflake deal works, you right. probably know this, is you're reading data into the cloud, the compute yep. actually occurs in the cloud. If I were HP, I'd be going yeah. to Snowflake saying, we can separate compute and storage, right. and we have GreenLake, we have on-demand. Why don't we run the compute on-prem and make it a full class, first class citizen right. for all of our yeah. customers' data? Yeah. And that would be really innovative. I, uh, and I think Mongo great. would be another thing. They've so got on-prem and the, the question is how many, how many Snowflake customers are telling Snowflake, can I run you on-premise? 
and how much deaf or open ears will they hear from that, right? Well, so this is wh how why they did would they make Adele. that deal, though? They did a deal. I think they did that deal because a customer came to them and said, if you don't exactly. do that deal, we're going to spend but less. But Snowflake, yeah. customers Snow make crazy things happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Even, even put an Oracle database in the Microsoft Azure data center, right? It would for the off. Who's thought this possible? Snowflakes. <laughs> Oracle on the, AWS. The snow, <laughs> snowflakes <laughs> in the world have to make a decision, Dave, on is it all Snowflake all the time? Because what? the reality is, and I think, again, this comes back down to the the track that HP could go up or down is going to be about software. Open source is now the software industry. There's no such thing as proprietary software, in my opinion, relatively speaking. Cloud scale and integrated, integrated integration software is proprietary. The workflows are proprietary. So if they can get that right with the partners, I would focus on that. I think they can tap open source. Look at Amazon with open source. Yeah. They sucked it up and they integrated it in. No, no, so, so integration so, is the deal, so, not so that's software exactly per se. But Snowflake's made the call. You were there, Lisa. They're yep. basically saying, it's, we have, you have to be in Snowflake in order to get the governance right. and the scalability, yeah. all that other wonderful stuff. Oh, but we, we'll do Apache Iceberg. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll open it up. We'll do Python. Yeah, but yeah. you can't okay. do a data clean room unless you are in Snowflake. Exactly. Right. Snowflake right. on Snowflake. Exactly. But, you got but it. isn't that what you heard from AWS all the time till they came out with Outposts, right? I mean, Snowflake is a market leader for what they're doing, right? So that they want to change their platform, I mean, kudos to them. They don't need to change the platform. They will be the last to change their platform to, a near, to do anything on premises, right? But I yeah. think the trend already shows that it's going that way. Well, if you look at Outpost as a <laughs> signal, Dave, the success of Outpost launched, what, four years ago they announced it? What? EKS is beating what Outpost is doing. Outpost yeah. is there. There's not a lot of buzz. And you talk to the insiders in the open source community. Uh, EKS and containers, to your point, mm -hmm. is moving faster on I won't say commodity hardware, but right. like could be white box or HP Dell, whatever. It's going to be that scale differentiation, and the edge story is is a good one. And I think with what we're seeing in the market now, it's the industrial edge. The back office was Gen One cloud, back office data center. Now it's hybrid. The focus will be industrial edge, machine learning and AI, and they have it here. And right. there's some some early conversations with. Uh, I heard it from. Uh, this morning, you guys interviewed uh, uh, John Schultz, right, with uh, the World Economic Forum, Kate yep. Berth, Butterfield, she was amazing. And then you had Justin bring up, uh, Hotarth bring up Quantum. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, that is a differentiator you know, for HP. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, they have the computing shops, they have the R&D, can they bring it well, to the table? As, as HPC, right, what they showed That's before, with right. uh, the Frontier system, right, so very impressive. So the ecosystem there. is the key for them, is because that's how they're going to fill the gaps. They can't, they, they can't only spend they so could, much on could. They could, they could, the high uh, HPC edge piece, uh, I wouldn't count them out of that game yet. Right. Because no, you co-locate a box, I'll use the word box particularly, at a telco tower, that's a data center. Right. Yep. Right, if done properly. Yep. So, you know, what Outpost was supposed to do, actually is a hybrid opportunity. Aruba gives them a unique yeah, advantage. But, but the key thing is, right, it's the yin and yang, right? It's the ecosystem, it's partners to bring the software workload, absolutely right but HPE has to keep the platform attractive enough, right? And the key thing there is that you have this workload capability thing, that you can bring things which you've built yourself. I mean, look at the telcos, right? Network function visualization, thousands of man years into these projects, right? So uh, if I can't bring it to your edge box, no, I'm not going to get to your edge right. box, right? So <laughs> Hold on, I got to ask you, since, and Dave too, since you guys are both here, and Lisa. You know, I said on the opening, they have serious customers and then those customers have serious problems. Cybersecurity, ransomware. So yeah, IT transformation now, industrial transformation, machine learning, check, 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 oh, sounds good. But at the end of the day, their customers have some serious problems. Right. right. Cyber, this is, this is high stakes poker. Yeah. What do you think HP's position for in the security? You mentioned containers, you got all this stuff, you got open source, supply chain shifted yeah. left, supply chain issues. What is their position with security? Because that's the big one. I think they have to have a mature attitude that customers expect from HPE, right? I don't have to educate HPE on security. So they have to have the partner offerings, again, we're back at the ecosystem, to have what probably you have. So bring your own security, apart from what they have to have out of the box to do business with them. This is why the shocker this morning with backup and recovery coming. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like important for that, right? Well, that's, so maybe that's, that's more, the ransomware. And some more skeletons, skeletons in the closet there, right? Which uh, customers should check, of course. But I think the expectations HPE understands that and brings it along, either for yeah. partner or 
natively. I, hey. I think it's I think it's services. I think yeah, point sure. next is the point of integration for their security. That's why two thirds is software and services, and right. a lot of that is services. Right. You know, you need security. We'll help you get there. We, People trust but, HP. But we nothing, nothing against Point Next or any professional service, they're all hardworking. But if I will have to rely on humans for my cybersecurity strategy yeah. on a daily level, I'm getting gray hair and have a lot of gray okay, hair already. But I, think <laughs> that's, but, I think, but I do think that's the current <clears throat> strategy. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of that, that stuff that's beginning to be designed in. But, but I, 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 my guess is a lot of it is services. Well, you got the Aruba part of the booth was packed. Aruba's there, yeah, Dave, you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Is that good enough? Because the word zero trust is kicked around a lot right. on one hand. On the other hand, other conversations, it's all about trust. So supply chain and software is trusting, yeah. trust, ver trust and verify. So you got this whole mentality of perimeter, gone mentality, it's right. zero trust. And if you've got software, it's yep. trust. Yep. Interesting thoughts there. How do you reconcile zero trust and then I need trust? What's What's you, what are you seeing, Holger, on that? Because I ask people all the time, they're like, uh, I'm zero trust, or is it trust? Yeah, <laughs> the middle ground, right? <laughs> <laughs> trust like, and like, In the meantime, people are mani <laughs> manipulating what's happening in your runtime containers, right? So uh, drift control is a new buzzword <laughs> there, that you check what's in your runtime containers, which supposedly are impenetrable, but people finding ways to hack them. So we'll see this cat and mouse game going on all the yeah, time. Yeah. There's always going to be the need for being in a secure, good environment from that perspective. Yeah. But the key is, Edge has to be more than Aruba, right? Yeah. If uh, yeah. <laughs> HPE goes away and says, oh yeah, we can manage your edge with our Aruba devices, that's not enough. It's the virtual capability, yeah. and you said the important thing before, it's about the data, right? Because the dirty secret of containers is, yeah, I move the code, but what enterprise code yeah. works without data, right? You can't say as enterprise, okay, we're done for the day, check tomorrow, we didn't persist your data, auditor, customer, we don't have your data anymore. So yeah. finding a way to transport the data and there, just one last thought, right? They have a super interesting asset. I want to break a lance for the venerable Map R, right? Which wrote their own storage drivers and gives you the chance to potentially do something in that area, which I'm personally excited about. But we'll see what happens. I mean, I think the holy grail is: can I can I put my data into a cloud? Who's ever you know call it a super cloud? Yeah. And can I? Is it secure? Is it governed? Can I share it and yeah. be confident that? It's discoverable and the, the, the person I give it to has the right to use it yeah. and, and it's the correct data. There's not like a zillion copies running. That's the holy grail. And I think the answer today is no, you can, you can do that maybe inside of AWS or maybe inside of Azure, right. maybe you know, and certainly inside of Snowflake. Can you do that inside of GreenLake? Well, you probably can inside of GreenLake, but then when you put it into the cloud, is it cross cloud? Is it really out to the edge? And that's where it starts to break down, but that's where the work is to be done. That's but where the one exabyte is. is in there already, right? So, yeah. man being man. Yeah, but okay, right, but it's, so. it's in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you do with can it? Can you share that data? Right. Can you actually automate governance? Yep. Right? Uh, is that data discoverable? Are there multiple copies of that data? What's the you know, master copy? All and right, here's a question for you guys. Here's a question for you guys, problems. analysts. Yeah. What do you think the psychology is of the CIO or CISO yeah. when HPE comes into town with GreenLake uh, and they say, what's your relationship with the hyperscalers? I'm a CIO, I got my environment. I might be sure. CapEx centric sure. or hey, I'm open, model, open minded to an operating model. Every one of these enterprises has a cloud relationship. Yeah. yeah. What's the dynamic? What do you think the psychology is of the CIO when they're rationalizing their, their trajectory, their architecture, cloud native, scale, integration with HPE GreenLake or HPE I services? think she or he hears defensiveness from no. HPE. I think she hears HPE or he hears HPE coming in and saying, you don't need to go to the cloud. But you know, you could keep it right here. I don't think that's the right posture. I think it should be, we are your cloud and we can manage whether it's on-prem, hybrid, in AWS, Azure, Google, across those clouds, and we have an edge story. That but should be the vision that they put forth. That's the super cloud vision, but I don't hear it from these guys. What do you think, Cycle? Do you agree uh, with that? I'm totally, to make, sorry to be boring, but I totally agree with uh, Dave on that, right? So the, the, the multi-cloud capability from a trusted large company has worked for anybody up and down the stack, right? You can look historically for uh, past layers with Cloud Foundry, right? There's history, venerable. You can look for DevOps with HashiCorp. You can look for database with MongoDB right now. So if HPE provides that data access, right, with all the problems of data gravity and egress costs and the workload capability, they will be doing really, really well. But we need to hear it more, right? We didn't hear much software today in the keynote, right? And I Do they have a competitive offering? 
vis-a-vis the, the, AWS or Azure. The question is, will it be an HPE offering? Or will Esmeral, their software platform, be one of the offerings and you as a customer can plug and play? Right? Will software be a differentiator for HPE? Right? And will it be close proprietary to the point to again be open enough for it? Or will they get that R&D for that? Or will they just say, okay, Esmeral is here on the side, it's your choice and you can use OpenShift or whatever. Yeah. We don't I, care. I, that's I, a big, that's the key question. Take? That's the key question. Is it, because it is a competitive strategy. Is it highly differentiated? No, Oracle has a highly differentiated oh, yeah. strategy, right? Is Dell highly differentiated? Eh, Dell differentiates based on its breadth. What? Right? Well, they're trying and, for the so, control plane too. Dell wants to be an okay. Yeah. Their their vision is differentiated. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but their execution today okay. is not high. All right, let me throw let me throw this out at you then. I'm just, Sorry, I'm, I'm, so I'm, 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 I'm HPE. I want to be the glue layer. Is that does that fly? What do you mean the glue I'll, layer? I want to be. You can do Amazon, but right. I want to be the glue layer between the clouds and. Our Green Lake will what's integrate. The, what's the incremental value that that glue provides? Provides comfort and reliability and control for the single pane of glass for AWS and Comes Azure. back to the data, in my yeah, opinion. There, there, there's yeah. glue levels on the data level, yeah. and there's glue levels on the API level, right? And there's different vendors in the different spaces, right? Um, I think HPE will want to play on the data side. We heard lots of data stuff. We hear part. that. But, but you have to see it, exactly. Yep. But it's, it's lacking today, and so yep. you, know, you guys know better than I, APIs yep. can be fragile, <laughs> and they can be, there's a lot of diversity in terms of the quality oh. of APIs and the documentation, how they work, how mature they are, but, how, how, what kind of performance they can provide, and recoverability. And so, just saying, oh wow, we're living the API economy, you know, the, it's going to take time to prove. Chime in here. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So guys, you've all been covering HPE for a long time. You know, when Antonio stood up on stage three years ago and said, by 2022, and here we are, we're going to be delivering everything as a service. He's saying, we've, we've done it, but, and we're a new company. Do you guys agree with that? Definitely. I uh, yes, no. yes, with a caveat. I think yes, the COVID pandemic slowed them down a lot because um, that gave a tailwind to the hyperscalers. Um, because of the, the force majeure of massive over, under forecasting of working at home. I mean, everyone I talked to was like, no one forecasted 100% work at home, the, um, the CapEx investments. So I think that was an opportunity that they'd be much farther along if there's no COVID. People but thought they, it wasn't possible. Yeah. Right? So we had the whole work from home thing, right? Where people trying to get people fired at IBM and Yahoo, right? So I would have this question covering the HR side and my other yeah. hat on, right? And I would ask CHROs, let's assume, because I didn't know about COVID, shame on me, right? I said, yeah. the big California earthquake breaks, right? Nobody gets hurt, but all the buildings have to be retrofitted and mm -hmm. checked for seismology. So everybody's working from home. I asked CHROs, what kind of productivity gap hit would you get by forcing everybody working from home with the office not safe? So one, one gentleman, I won't know him his name, he said 20%. And the other one's going, <laughs> you're smoking, it's 40, 50%. We need to be in the <laughs> office, we need to meet in person, right? And now we went for this exercise, luckily not with the California yeah. earthquake, well, with the price of COVID, and well, we've seen what it can do to, to, to productivity. Well, right. pro the productivity, but also the impact. So like with all the in, um, stories we've done over the two years, the people that want, came out ahead were the ones that had good cloud action. They were already in the cloud. So I, I think they're definitely a different company in the sense of, they, I give them a pass. I think yep. they're definitely a new company and I'm not going to judge them on it. I think they're doing great, but I think pandemic definitely slowed them down. No so doubt I, about it. I have a different take on this. I think, so if you go back a little history, I mean, you said this, I could steal your line. Meg Whitman took one for the Silicon Valley team. Mm. Right, she came in, I don't think she ever was excited about that. that. You, just said, you said that, and I think you're right on. <laughs> Find the tape to, on that one. She had to figure out, how do I deal with this mess? I have EDS, I got PCs. She never should have spun off the PC. But okay, but you certainly could, hey, listen, maybe, maybe uh, Gerstner never should have gone all in on services, and, and IBM would dominate in something other than mainframes. They had ThinkPads even for a while, but, but, but so, she had that mess to deal with. She dealt with it and however they dealt with it. Antonio came in he, he, and he said, all right, we're going to focus the company and we're going to focus the mission on, not the machine. Remember those yeah. presentations but. which would just make your eyes glaze over. We're going all in on Azure service. We're and gonna, Edge, he was all on We're going to build our own cloud. We acquired Aruba. He made some acquisitions in HPC to help differentiate. Yep. And they are definitely a much more focused yeah. company now. Uh, and unfortunately, I wish, Antonio, with CEO in 2015, 
because that's really when this should have started. Yeah, and then, and if you remember back then, Dave, we, we were interviewing Docker with DevOps yeah. teams, they had mm -hmm. composability, they were on hybrid really early. I think they might have even coined the term hybrid before VMware tries to take credit for it, but they were first on hybrid, they had DevOps, they had infrastructure as code, HPE had an HP had an awesome cloud team. Yeah. But, and then and then they tried to go public cloud. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then Vecti, you know, just made them. And I mean, that's, it was just a mess. The focus is there. So. I, I give them huge props. And I think I think the Green Lake, to me, is exciting here because it's much better than it was two years ago when, when yep. we talked to when it's we starting to the, get real. It's yeah. it's a real thing, and I think the the tell will be partners. If they make that right and can yep. pull their differentiation, Ecosystem. their scale Look. and their customers, and fill the software gaps with partners, mm -hmm. and then create that integration opportunity, it's going to be a home run. If they don't do that, they're going to miss the operating But model. they have to have their own, to your point, yep. they have to have their own software innovation They have as to well. have good infrastructure, yeah. ways to build applications. I don't want to build it with somebody else. I don't want to yeah. take a Microsoft stack, or an open source stack, and not sure if it's going to work with HP. <laughs> so they have to have an app dev answer. I absolutely agree with that. And the, the big thing for the partners is, which is a good thing, right? Yeah. HPE will not move into applications. Right? You don't have to have the fear where Microsoft is if they will go large, right? If AWS kind of like comes up with APIs and manufacturing, right? Uh, Google the same thing with their vertical push, right? So uh, HPE will not have the CapEx, <laughs> not the RD, yeah, to they're go not to enterprise steal your applications. IP, so right. as an ISV, making them the partner, great the point. bonus of being able to on premise is an attractive That's partner. a great point, Holger. So that's an inflection yeah. point for the next 12 months to watch what yeah, we see absolutely. running on GreenLake. Yeah. yeah, and I think one of the things that came out of the, the last couple of events this past year, and I'll bring this up, We'll table it and we'll watch it. Yep. And it's early, and this, I think this is like even not even the first inning. The machine learning AI impact to the industrial piece, I think we're going to see a, a brand new era of accelerated digital transformation on the industrial physical mm. world. Yep. Back office cloud, data center, accounting, all the stuff that's applications, the, app, the real world from space to like robotics. I think that HP Edge opportunity is going to be visible and different. So guys, Antonio Neri is on tomorrow. This is only day one. If you can imagine this power panel on day one, can you imagine tomorrow? <laughs> what is your last question for each of you? What is your, what, what question would you want to ask him tomorrow? Holger, start with you. How is HPE winning in the long run? Because we know the on-premise market will shrink. Right, and they can out-execute Dell, they can out-execute Lenovo, they can out-execute Cisco and get a bigger share of the shrinking market, but that's not a long-term strategy, right? So why should I buy HPE stock now and have a good return, put it in the, in the safe and forget about it and have a great return 20 years from now? What's the really long-term strategy? Might be unfair because they were in survival mode to a certain point out of the mass post McWhitman situation, but what is really the long-term strategy? Is it more on the hardware side? Is it going to go on the HPE, the frontier side? It's going to be a DNA question which I would ask Antonio. John. I would ask him <coughs> what relative to the macro conditions relative to the, their customer base. I'd say, because the customers are the scoreboard. Can they create a value proposition with their, I, mean, I use the Microsoft 365 example, how they kind of went to the cloud. So my question would be, Antonio, what is your core value proposition to CIOs out there yep. who want to transform and take a step function increase for value with HPE? Tell me that story, I want to hear, and I don't want to hear, oh, we got a portfolio, and no, no. What value are you enabling your customers to do. What, and what should that value be? I think it's going to be what we were kind of riffing on, which is you have to provide either what their product market fit needs are, which is, are you solving a problem? Is it a pain point? Is it a growth driver? Uh, and what's, the, what's that tailwind? And it's, obviously we know at cloud, we know edge. The story's great, but what's the value proposition? Go, by going with HPE, you get X, Y, and Z. If they can explain that clearly with real so, qualitative and quantitative data, it's a home run. He had a great line at the analyst summit today where somebody asking questions. I'm just listening to the customer. So be ready for the Steve Jobs quote. <laughs> yeah. Listening to the customer, you can't We're build working. something yeah, great. Right. Listening so, to the customer, you'll be good for the next quarter, the well, next financial then year. Then I would say, what are the yeah. customers saying? <laughs> so I, I would make an observation, and my question would be, so my observation would be, the cloud is growing collectively yeah. at 35%. It's, you know, it's approaching $200 billion with a big, big four, if you include Alibaba. IBM has actually said, hey, we're going to grow. They've promised 6% growth. Uh, uh, Cisco, I think, is at 8 or 9% mm. growth. Dow's growing in double digits. Antonio and HPE have promised 
three to 4% growth. So what do you have to do to actually accelerate growth? Because three to 4%, my view, not enough to answer Holger's question is, why should I buy HBE stock? But, well, if they, have product, if they have customer and there's demand and traction, to me that's going to drive the growth numbers and I think the weak side of the forecast means that they don't have that fit yet. Yeah, so what has to happen for them to get above five, six percent well, that's growth. That's what we're going to analyze. I mean I, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I wish I had a better answer. I'd tell them. <laughs> but I fe it, feels, it feels like, you know, HP has an opportunity to say, here's the new HPE. Yeah. Okay, and this is what we stand for. And here's the one thing that we're going to do that consistently drives value for you, the customer. And that's going to have to come into some either architectural, mm -hmm. cloud shift, or a data thing, or we are your store for blank. Well, well, I love the above. Yeah. I guess the other question is, would, would you know, he won't answer. Maybe this is a rude question. <laughs> would suspending things like dividends and stock buybacks and putting it into R&D, if do. you have confidence in the market and you know what to do, why wouldn't you just accelerate R&D and put the money there? IBM, since 2007, IBM spent, this is the last stat, and then yeah. we can go. In 2007, IBM way outspent Google and Amazon in R&D. And, and CapEx too, by the way. Yep. Subsequent to that, they've spent, I believe it's the numbers, close to $200 billion on stock buybacks and dividends. They could have owned cloud. Yep. And so, look at this business, the technology business by and large is driven by innovation. Yep. Yeah. And so how do you innovate if you I'm have buying, I'm buying HPE sure. because they're reliable, high quality, and they have the outcomes that I want. Well, buy their you products know, and course, services. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd buy the stock. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But she has to answer ultimately because they're a public company, right? So yeah. right. it's his job, yeah. So. Never a dull moment with the three of you around. <laughs> yeah. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your insights, your an analysis from day one. I can't imagine what day two is going to bring tomorrow. Dave, you and I are going to be anchoring here. We've got a jam-packed day, lots going on, hearing from the ecosystem, from leadership. As we mentioned, Antonio is going Antonio to be Antonio and Fidelma Russo, I'm dying and to Fidelma talk to as well as yeah. on the CTO, going to be another action-packed day. I'm excited for it. Guys, thanks so much for right. sharing your insights and for letting me join this power panel. Great, great to be here. <laughs> power panel, plus me. <laughs> All right, for Holger, John, and Dave, I'm Lisa. You're watching theCUBE. Our day one coverage of HPE Discover wraps right now. Don't go anywhere, because we'll see you tomorrow for day two, live from Vegas. Have a good night. <laughs>